What's up, everyone? How's it going? Welcome to another Demystifying Post-Reduction Motion Monday. My name is Ellie Wade. I'm a trainer at Maxon, and I'm joined with two very special guests. Hey, Ian and Dustin. How's it going? Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. Amazing. Happy now Monday. We're... Happy Thanks Monday. Thanks for joining now. us, both of you, because I know it's a, it's a holiday, right, in the US? Yes, it is a yeah, holiday, is. Juneteenth, so happy holiday to those who are watching. Uh, I'm just here to hang out and have a good time and watch the magic unfold as we cover a bunch of uh, substance and redshift and lighting and all sorts of fun, jazzy stuff. That is the plan. So really quickly, before we get into it, um, don't forget you can always see the kind of events that we have going on at Maxon by heading over to this page here, which is the maxon.net events page. And you can see all the webinars, live streams, sessions that we have across all of the Maxon tools. So whether it's like ZBrush or Cinema 4D or Redshift, all of them uh, normally get covered. And if I just scroll down, we can see we've got, we've got an Ask the Trainer uh, ask me anything this Thursday with Noseman and Jonah. So if you have any questions for our wonderful master trainers, then come check that out. And we also, so normally what we do is every second and fourth Thursday, we have an master trainer. But there is actually a fifth Thursday in June. I nearly forgot what month it was. In June. Uh, so we're actually doing a Ask the Trainer special. We haven't actually defined a topic yet, but... Yeah, just wanted to let you know that we will be running an extra Ask the Trainer. If you have any suggestions for us, then uh, let us know, and I can tell I can tell the team. Well, I, I think we are doing a thing where we are taking some questions. Oh, so is that the? I think that's is that the thing. That... <laughs> so if you have questions, you should show up and be like, "Ian told me I can ask a question." Basically, and I will. You can ask. I will. Then. I will be there. I will be there. I promise you. I promise. I will be there. Once you've said it on a live stream, it has to happen. Those are the rules. It's kind of, it's kind of gold now, yeah. It's so, kind of the thing, yeah. Yep, you're welcome. <laughs> this, this... <laughs> uh, cool. Also, if you ever miss any of our sessions or you want to learn something new, then check out the Maxon Training Team YouTube channel, which is this page here, which is where you can see all of our upcoming live streams. For example, this one right now. And all the other things like quick tips and tutorials and, and recordings from all of our other sessions in their own lovely little playlists. To help uh, you question for you, Ellie. Are you, are you sharing your screen? Because I don't currently see the screen. Oh, see, this is, this is why I'm not a multitasker. <laughs> I'm not. A, do you know what? Oh, God. Hang on. That's not going to work, is it? There we go. There we go. <laughs> hey, we do it live all the time. So if you're here. Okay. So quick, quick disclaimer. Normally, we have the amazing Kyle on, who's our producer. But as it's a US holiday, and as we can see, I am apparently in charge, which it, I'm, yeah, I'm is not never doing a good anything. thing. I'm just <laughs> hanging out. I told you. I the guys are here to hang out. I'm here to apparently <laughs> not share my screen and just talk to you. Oh, um, sorry about that. So this is the events page. If you've been on one of our streams, you've seen it. It's this lovely one here. This is our YouTube channel. We're doing a quick little recap. And also as a quick thank you for those of you who are part of our sessions and part of our streams and part of our lovely community, we like to give away uh, free t-shirts. I say free, all you have to do is pay for shipping. The code for that is, I might have to drop these in later, unless Ian, you have access to those. Uh, if it's the same thing, I believe I have access for it. So give me one second and I'll drop it, drop, drop it. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So grab yourself a t-shirt. All you have to do is pay for shipping. Bada bing, bada boom. Mic drop it. Oh, there you go. It is posted right there. So definitely Perfect. use all the links and the, uh, yeah, the pass, the, the password for that is ZBrush and Substance, all caps, one word, not three. I just read it as three. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, we're here all never, day for the Please joke, never man. leave us ever again. <laughs> I am here we're all day. We started well, everyone. Uh, cool. Yeah. So, a little bit about what I'm going to cover today, and then before, oh, actually, yeah, do it. Yeah, let's do that, and then I'll hand over to you, Dustin. Let's we'll do that because we've got Dustin here, so we know he's going to show some magic as well. So the whole theme of this month is we've been diving into Substance Painter workflows and combining them with the Maxon tools. 
so ZBrush, for example, and Cinema 4D and Redshift. And it's it's kind of my turn to take over this week. And I'm actually in the process of learning Substance Painter. So this is a really nice experience and experiment for me to really dive in and, and get to know the workflow. And this is this is something I, I put together. The, the amazing Ian Robinson sculpted this. I can take no credit for how good this looks because well, this man is the reason it looks very cool. Well, I'm I'm also going to 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 pass it on to shout out to uh, a, a good friend of mine, a Mr. Patrick 4D. He's been inspiring me to just like yes, do quick, same. fun daily sculpts and food is just delicious and everyone likes looking at it so i was like let me try a few things and and no joke this burger like i think this burger took me like 40 minutes to put together and and it yeah you showed fun. me some of the techniques and as someone who is a total zbrush newbie even i was like you know what maybe i could actually i could do this you could do it i believe in you for sure <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I'm going to basically break down the different elements of, of this shot. We're going to talk a little bit about the process of exporting, bring it into Substance Painter. I'm going to break down uh, basically the textures that I created in Substance are the, the, the brioche bun. So this sort of like top hair in the bottom area. Eventually, I'm going to create them all in Substance, but, you know, we, we're busy people, aren't we? Um, so yeah, we're going to break that down, talk about how we can export our mesh and our textures and why that's going to be important. And then we're going to have a look at building those textures, a little bit of the lighting setup, because it's quite simple. So I wanted to try and create a, a stylized, semi-realistic look. I, I can't call this realistic. However, I'm happy with like the stylized look. So we'll talk about that as well. Um, yeah. So yeah, let's just get into it because yeah. I'm, you know, we're ten minutes in. I've talked enough. Yeah, let's, let's do it. Let's get you, into know, it. You, know, it's funny. you know, it's funny. When in doubt, I just call things stylized because a really close yeah. friend of mine, she was like, she was telling me, her name's Ashley Adam. She's an awesome artist. But I was like, hey, I'm kind of going for the stylistic look. She's like, everything is stylized. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're so right. <laughs> I was like, there you go, mic drop, boom. So that's what we're that's, calling it. That's what we're saying now. We're saying stylized now. And um, the guys are going to keep an eye on the questions. If you have any questions for me or for anyone or anything, just uh, yeah, let us know in the chat. Cool. So this is the this is the entire model inside of Cinema 4D, and it's all separated into its different elements that Ian sculpted in ZBrush. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to export this as an FBX. But I want to talk about really quickly, just an element of, of UVing or auto UVing. Because I knew this was going to be a still, I can get away with what we'd call maybe quick and dirty UVs. And there's th this could have been done at different aspects of this, this workflow. So Ian, for example, could have UV'd and unwrapped it inside of ZBrush. I could do it now inside of Cinema 4D. If I come over to let's what one should we do? Like let's this one here. We can come into our UV edit. We can then set our UV from projection, and then we could set up an automatic UV unwrap. And it's it's not always like the best, but just to get some quick and dirty UVs for a still image, that's absolutely fine. And we need that when it comes to working in Substance Painter. Or the other option, which is the option I actually went for, is when we import an FBX into uh, Substance Painter, we can use their auto UV unwrapping. And that's what I did. Then there's another element of, what, of needing to then export the mesh because we have to make sure our UVs match across the board when it comes to painting these textures. Because if I don't do that or I change my UVs, everything that I paint and the textures that I set up in Substance aren't going to fit and project correctly when I come back into here. Uh, can we so, can we just dub the term like stylized UVs? Does that fit? Can we just like <laughs> blanket blanket that over everything? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so I, everything yeah. now is is stylized hyphen for the term. Yeah. That's oh, yeah. it. You can even throw in the word master in there too. You know, so <laughs> so stylized is UV master. <laughs> this is the most stylized, stylized master. dream ever. <laughs> yeah, we're just gonna throw stylized and master on everything. 
Oh yeah. I'm changing the title when this <laughs> posts to YouTube. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. So so you being at some stage will need to be done. Uh, I'll show you how I did it in Substance Painter because it's really quick, it's really easy. Um, and we don't have to then worry about doing it in the previous like elements, either ZBrush or C4D. But before I export this, what I am going to do is we can do a little trick by just creating standard Cinema 4D materials just by double clicking, we create a material and then naming them relative to the object that they're going to be on. So for example, I've got this top bun, I've got this bottom bun and there's nothing actually on these materials. They're just default. I've just double clicked and renamed it. That's it. And I'm going to throw the top bun and the bottom bun. And I would do this for all of my different elements, all the aspects of my model that's been separated. And the reason this is uh, this is good, because when I then export this as an FBX and bring it into Substance Painter, it's going to automatically create a texture set for those individual elements, which is really great and really handy. And we'll see that inside of Substance in about five minutes. So once I've then created all of these and I've applied them, I would then come in, I would select all of the elements I need and I'm going to go to File, and then Export Selected Objects as FBX. And then I just kept this all as the default settings, and then I press OK, and then I'll save that. And then I get my FBX file to then load into Substance. What I wouldn't want to do, or wouldn't necessarily want to do at this stage, because I have other elements in here, would be to go to File and Export, because this is going to export the entire Cinema 4D file uh, as an FBX. Okay, so into Substance Painter. So once I've exported my FBX, I can then come up to File, New, and then we have our new project and we have our template. And by default, it's set to PBR, which is perfect because that is a physically based workflow, which is pretty much how most uh, render engines work now. So Redshift does, Octane does, I'm pretty sure things like Cycles and that will as well. Uh, so we want to leave that as it is. And then in this file option, this is where I'm going to select my FBX. So I'll come down and my burger bun FBX, I would just open that up. And I can choose my document resolution. I tend to go with a 2048. And then here is where we can auto unwrap. So Wes talked about this last week. And so if we click our options, we can actually do an auto unwrap inside of Substance Painter. And if you have no information or no seams, for example, no like pre-created info, then you just need to recompute all of them. Uh, and that's what I did for this. And it actually worked, it worked quite well. And Ian, I believe you told me this, is the auto unwrap algorithm actually the same in yeah. Substance Painter and Cinema 4D? So technically you could have done this either way, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, as I understand, yeah, it's the same SDK that we utilize for both, which is really cool. So um, yeah, both methods would work. I'd also like to note too, and just just to kind of put that out there to ease minds for anyone who's who's hearing this or kind of even just like, well, should I learn UVs? You should absolutely learn UVs more in depth if you're asking yourself that question for sure. It's But in some instances, having dirty UVs is okay. It's just understanding what UVs are and why they're important. So if you understand the basics of what UVs are and why they're important, then in this scene, like Elliot mentioned, we're not animating this. So we don't need things to be super precise and clean. We just need it to be close enough and good enough to get the shot because of what we're going to be doing. So if you're going to be doing animation and some crazy stuff, then please spend the time, get some really nice UVs. But for stuff like this, you know, I come from the toy world. I'll even use down and dirty UVs to just kind of get something, you know, close enough. So depending on what the project's for, just kind of throw it out there. But yeah, so small little rant, sorry, but yes. <laughs> no, good. We, we like the rant. Also on this topic, I can't say too much, but there will be a UVing series workshop be, yep. coming soon. Yep. Yep. And We're that's all cover I can UVs. say. That's all we can say. So yes, if UVing is something you really want to know about, we're going to be covering a lot of like really cool stuff in depth and kind of like the quick and easy methods as well that we can just throw into our dailies and, and get things done. Including in Z. Stylized. <clears throat> Stylized, Stylized UV, UV Master. 
<laughs> cool. So I'm not going to do this because I've already I've done this, but what would happen is I'd hit OK. It's going to do a unwrap. And depending on how many objects you have, it will depend on how long that will take. If I just cancel that, I can actually open the file that I've been working on, which I believe is this one. Yes, cool, this one here. We got you, Sharon. She says, sign me up because I can't get the hang of them on a complicated project. We got you, don't worry. Don't UVs don't worry is a very it. rinse and repeat method, believe you me. Um, we won't, I don't, you know, we probably won't go too far into UDIMs because we want this to be a nice super approach, but you know, it, it will be, trust me, it'll be really good for you to, to get that, that aspect. So we got you. Cool. So this is just the burger bun that was then exported as an FBX with those standard default materials on, which we can see have created their own texture set list. So that's what they're going to do. You can see that they're named exactly the same as what they were named inside of here. It's a really nice uh, way of working just to speed up that process. And then the only thing I did do, so let me just hide that one there. The only thing I did do was I actually baked my mesh map. So if I just hit this little like croissant icon here, we can actually bake uh, certain elements and certain maps, which we can then use inside of Substance. For example, we can create a, a curvature map, which we can then use and create masks and blending modes and layers all based on this information. So I did normal ambient occlusion, curvature, position, and thickness. And again, Wes went through these in a lot more detail uh, last week. My focus will be on bringing it back in Cinema 4D and Redshift uh, a bit more than the substance side of things. Yeah. Um, we have a question to... come through oh, real yeah. quick. Um, it's this... actually just more of like, can uh, this person's asking, can my ancient laptop with an Intel HD graphics card actually... Uh, run Substance Painter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop a link into Substance Painter's Adobe's uh, spec and, and hardware requirements. Um, but I can say that uh, my personal one that I've built for computer, like my own, is is fairly, it's like six, seven years old um, as far as specs go. And it runs Substance Painter pretty well. You, you know, because again, the Substance Painter, you're not going to be throwing in a ton of topology. You're not going to be throwing in millions and millions of topology. But like what Wes said last week, if you missed it, go check it out. Substance Painter mm -hmm. can run and get some pretty dense files in there. But a lot of artists use it for the super low res. And then you're taking that high information and baking that on. So um, so you should be okay because it's not really, you're not, you shouldn't be pushing the limits too much of what your system can run. But there's the specs. Just go ahead and check that out just to make sure since you know your specs and you can compare against what's recommended. Cool, thanks, Ian. Yep. Okay, so as I said, I've been I've been learning Substance Painter for the last few months, I'd say. So I'm still at the very beginning of my journey, but I really enjoy building textures inside of Redshift. And I feel like the information is kind of like transferable. It's just a, there's a lot more possibilities and it's a lot nicer workflow with the layering. But essentially, you're creating your fill layers, you're then creating your masks, you're then using blending modes and then different tricks like roughness maps or dirt maps to then create all of your individual texture maps. And these materials are relatively simple. I'll show you them, but I want to quickly talk about um, when it comes to working in substance or really when it comes to working in 3D in general, and you're trying to create things that look a little bit more stylized, uh, working with, hey, everyone, take a shot. <laughs> um, it's good to work with reference images, or at least I personally find it's really helpful to work with reference shots because just doing things randomly from memory is never going to be as good as just having that image in front of you. And so let me head back over here. I am a real like fan of Pinterest. I, I use Pure Ref as well because it's nice to have everything together and have it on my screen. Um, but yeah, a little Pinterest and just, I just searched like cheeseburger and found this really amazing shot, which is, you know, it's making me sad to see because it's like half five in the afternoon and I'm kind of getting hungry and I'm watching this and regretting doing a cheeseburger basically. <laughs> um, so I used this as an idea of getting 
like some of the colors, how I would then have some of the surface detail, maybe a little bit of displacement as well. And I just used this and, and started to build up my textures. And I think whether or not it's because I like we are in a 3D world, I see this as its texture maps, um, which is probably a sad thing to say, but I don't mind saying it. So I can see the base color texture map here. I can see the surface detail. And the idea behind substance or just building materials in general is to recreate those elements and recreate those layers. And the more of that detail and those layers that you have and the more accurate they look towards like a photograph or the real world thing, the better and more stylized it's going to look. Wait, would it be more stylized? I think it would be less stylized if it's, if it's closer to uh, realistic, right? I thought, weren't we just, is that our buzzword for today? I, I think, I mean, well, I don't know. I think there might be a, a more stylized. Yeah. Sure. The, it's, it's the closer, it will be closer to, to real. But I feel, okay, I feel like you know I what? can't say realism because I'm not about to create realism. I'll tell you what. Let's let the chat decide. Chat. The chat. This decide. is up to you. Chat, this is for you. You get to decide. Are we continuously going to be saying this is stylized or are we going to say semi-realistic? You get this. You get to decide. Stylized? Semi-realistic. <laughs> and if you decide to throw a master in there, I'm with you. So let's go. <laughs> so, yeah. So this is just made up of a couple of like different layers um, if I just sort of like switch these off, so we can use this little eye here to see. Oh, it would be cool if I was actually on the right one. Here we go. So this here, this is my folder with a few base colors here, base, base fills. So let's just sort of pull it out. And yeah, I just I just really started off by trying to create a a base color texture map or a base color that looked. Uh, similar to that photograph or that reference image that we saw. And again, it's pretty much just using these fill layers. So if I click this button here, it's going to create a new fill layer. And if we create a fill layer, we can then define what kind of material property it can control. And it can control multiple. So we can see we have our color, our height, our roughness, our metalness, our normal, our opacity, and our emission, all things that we recognize from working in render engines and building materials. And then on our fill layers, we can then right click and we can add masks. And then in those masks, we can begin to apply different maps like dirt, roughness, or curvature from the mesh maps that we have baked out. And we can just start to layer things up. So in here, I just created this secondary top color and then applied a 3D linear gradient generator so if I just switch that on, we get that nice that gradient, what I would call like a ramp, but it's working as a mask. And then I just applied a grayscale texture map onto another fill layer to create these elements here. So if I just come in, we can see that we've now added this, just, just to break up that gradient a little bit. And then finally, I threw a third layer on, which is just these little speckles along the top. And again, I just wanted to keep it simple. Um, and so that was that was pretty much what I ended up doing for, for the base color. And then from there, I threw on some materials, the, some assets inside of here, again, just by creating a fill layer and then throwing these materials inside of here, which already have their own properties set up. So if, like me, your first getting into Substance Painter and you don't necessarily know how or, or want to build every single element from scratch, uh, which you can do, which is why it's so amazing and such a great uh, software package to use, you can use pre-made materials. But what you can do is you can then adjust those pre-made materials. So here, this was the original color of that material because it was the some, like a skin texture. But because I don't need that color, I've already created mine, I can just remove that. And instead, I'm just using the height and the roughness information to create this over the top of here. And then that was how I created this whole material. It is just those small, simple techniques, fill layers, masks, and pre-made materials controlling the different material properties. And it ended up looking something like this. And I'm, I'm quite way. happy with it, to be honest. I'm quite happy. Like, no, that considering, looks so good. Considering I've not worked in substance too long, I'm, I'm happy with the way it is. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to like diving more into it. And then I just did a similar sort of technique 
if I just switch these all back on for that bottom bun as well. Actually, I didn't want, which one was the wrong one? That one, there we go. Cool. Yeah, that's looking that's looking really good. And also too, just real quick, just to throw it back. So it looks like it looks like uh overall that we have kind of a realistic with stylized, which was a, a, a PBR, a, a, a meta spot. stylized. But then somebody also said that they all they liked more stylized looks because they were trickier to get right. So I think it's okay if we say that it's kind of stylized. <laughs> kind of kind of stylized. <laughs> that's that's what that's what i'm going with perfect <laughs> cool thanks thanks chat i appreciate it okay so yeah so fill layers masks and then throwing in things like dirt maps and and fractal noises which all come inside of a substance and then from here once we're then finished once we've created all our textures we've got all of our texture sets we can actually come in and if you work in so you if we're talking about working on maybe like a, a less powerful machine we can work in a smaller size or, or a lower size lower resolution when we create our textures and when we're painting and everything will be faster and a little bit more snappy and then when it comes to then exporting we can actually change this size and you won't have to repaint it will just update everything for you and it will resize that for you. Um, so that's another trick that you could do um, if you'll have a less powerful machine. Cool, so once we're good to go, we can then look at exporting this, exporting our textures and our mesh. So the important thing I do wanna quickly mention here is if you have auto unwrapped inside of Substance Painter, if you've imported your FBX and you've unwrapped inside of here, you will need to export the mesh because the exported mesh and the FBX that you now export will include your UVs, which is what we've based all of our painting and all of our texturing on. If I didn't do that and threw this on the original FBX, which hasn't got any UVs set up, it's not gonna match properly. If I did my UV unwrapping in ZBrush or in Cinema 4D and, ex and exported the FBX with those UVs already on and then did my painting and my everything, I wouldn't need to auto unwrap in Substance and therefore I wouldn't need to export the mesh. I know that and I'm making a point of it because I definitely did that this morning and was like, why isn't this working? So don't do what I did. <laughs> so then we just export our mesh. Again, I don't need to necessarily do that because I've got all of this exported already. And then we can export our textures. So if we come into exporting our textures, we're gonna have a little look at our options or our output directory here. This is where we're gonna save all of our files to. So we can see I've got a, a folder set up for this week's um, DPP. We have our output template, which remember when we first created the file, that was the PBR template that we set up. We then have our file type and size based on each texture set size. So we can see texture set, we've set that to 4K. So now gonna be 4K. We can then come into the output template. We have a bunch of presets. We even have a redshift preset and we can see we have our base color, roughness, metalness, normal height field and emission color. You can add the different maps. You can take away the different maps. You can only export what you want to export. And then if we go to our list of exports, we can see we can see the texture set here, which is this bottom bun or top bun. And we have the naming conventions with the size and the format as well. And then all we have to do is hit the export button and then it's going to export and go through all of those different textures for you, depending on how many you have and how many texture sets or objects you have in here, the longer it's going to take. And once we've done that, we then have our texture maps ready to then use inside of uh, Cinema 4D and Redshift. And so let's head in and let's, let's actually create some stuff. So let's get rid of that. And yeah, so this was the original, this was the original FBX. And so before I continue to work inside of here, if, we did this method where we unwrapped in substance and exported the mesh. You will need to import that new FBX and replace 
the older one because the new one is the one that has the correct UVs on and therefore the texture maps are going to map correctly. If I threw them on this one now, it wouldn't work properly. So don't forget to do that if you've worked in that particular method. Okay. So another another quick thing, a quick topic that I think um, we can all talk about, like Dustin, Ian included, is when it comes to creating an element of realism inside of uh, 3D, people talk about real world scale being really important. And that is the case. If we're trying to create an element of realism, working with real scales will, will help just make everything react as it should and as it does in the real world. For example, when it comes to lighting, I'm sure Dustin can talk about this far better than I can. Um, having real world scale and real world elements and sizes is gonna help when it comes to lighting our scene. Having the size of the light react as it should, having the focal lengths and depth of field react as it should. Is that right? Uh, 100%. Uh, there's it's definitely good to work in real world scale. Um, I, <laughs> I like to stylize my workflow, <laughs> quite often. Uh, depending on, depending on what I'm doing. Um, you know, there, there is a time and in place for, uh, fudging it, if you will, and just kind of throwing things, you know, throwing things together. Um, but most of the time, uh, you know, working in a realistic scale is best. And, uh, you know, for, I guess, a, a quick tip to, you know, quickly get into a scale that makes sense. And I, I think most of the time, unless you're working on like highly technical stuff, um, you just need it close enough to believable scale. It doesn't always have to be down to the millimeter. Um, but oftentimes what I'll do is say something like, you know, a, a cheeseburger, for example. Um, you know, I, I like to make you know, larger burgers, uh, but that's, you know, personal preference, <laughs> but you could figure out, you know, kind of the rough scale of, of a cheeseburger. Um, you know, we'll say, you know, four or five inches, you know, in, in um, you know, just general it's diameter, diameter. Yeah. Diameter. Um, and you can create a cylinder that would be like a dummy object. So once you say you purchase something, um, you know, off of CG trader, you know, or art station, for example, um, and the scale's not right. You get it into your scene. You find out that it's like a centimeter in size, um, create something like a cylinder, make that cylinder, the diameter, you know, that you want keeping in mind that I believe we use a radius, uh, in cinema. And so mm -hmm. just cut that in half and make that, you know, the, the general diameter that you want. And then, you know, you can go use that diameter for the uh, width and then you can adjust the height, you know, to make sense. Um, but you can use that and just kind of scale your object with inside that dummy object. And that's going to get you generally as close as you really need to be um, as far as a, a real scale is concerned. So that's kind of the, the dummy approach for objects and, you know, things like products. If you're scaling a room, uh, you can use a dummy object, uh, you know, like the figure uh, that we have in mm -hmm. cinema, and you can just scale that figure up to, you know, the, the height of a person um, and then easily gauge from there the height of walls, height of doors, things of that nature, um, which is going to help out quite a bit. So sorry for the ramble, but <laughs> that's generally yeah, how I, I would do it as fast as possible. No, that's that's perfect. Also, I can I can. Oh, you my uh, slightly lazy person trick that I used for to resize this one was just to come into the asset browser and I just took one of like the plates, just grab like a dinner plate, because these are all um I believe real world size and scale, especially the redshift ones. Um, and then yeah, resized it that way. Just make your patties a hundred millimeter wide, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> Dodge. You, you have those. You, you've ever seen. You, you've ever seen those challenges where they're just like a massive, like you know, twelve pound burger that you have to eat in an hour. I don't know. I, I, it's there. Yeah. yeah. If you do this, you eat for free. But you got, like, yeah. Semi hot okay. afterwards. Before before you go too far. Um, yeah. 
there is a question coming through. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to highlight it. It's a big one. It's a doozy. He says, question one of, <laughs> they say question one of two. Uh -huh. I, I fasten, yeah. fasten your seatbelt. This question is about your RS quick tip 14. I'm curious, did, how did. Do you know what? I did, did see this and I was going to record a quick thing to, to send to you. Basically, oh. let me just, a little side note here. Let me see if I can find the project file and I can just show you. I love how I didn't um, even have to read the question. You're like, I know it. Don't worry about it. I got I you. Saw <laughs> I saw it. Um, what was it? Was it this one? If I can't find it quickly, I won't. I'll just explain. So quick tip 14. Mm, okay, I can't find it quick enough because I well, am You have a video super... recording coming soon, yeah? Oh, hang on, mate. Hang on. Wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Here we go. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Complete tangent to answer the question. Um, yes. So this is the quick tip that runs through using like Photoshop layers inside of Redshift. And I can just very quickly show you the render. Looks something like this. Beautiful. I mean, it's also supposed to actually be... So yeah, uh, just quick side note, for anyone who doesn't know, you can use Photoshop files and Photoshop layers inside of Redshift. You can just come in, uh, drop the texture in, and then you can find some cool looking patterns and stuff like this. So what they're referring to is this little Redshift logo on here. And what that is, is you can use material stacking inside of Redshift. And so we can see this is the can. This is the main shape of the can. Let me just dock that there, actually, so we can see that. And on here, I've got that can material. So this one here. This is the first texture that we have on there. And then we have the second texture, which is just this aluminium uh, top and bottom. And then this one here is our logo. So if I double click this logo, what we have is the Redshift logo here, and then, oh, I've hidden it, the Redshift logo here, that then, because it's a PNG with an alpha in it, we can then split out the alpha, plug it into the opacity, and then we get just the logo. And then if we throw that onto the same object that has that can texture, we can go to projection flat, and then if we go into our UV edit mode here, we can actually reposition the logo like that. So that's what it is. Two different materials on the same thing using material stacking. Such that's a good awesome. way to do it. It's so much faster. <laughs> it's so, so much, much faster. faster. Yes. But you know what? Even though this is a tangent, I love the fact that this is a soda can. So we're on we're on brand. We're still that's on <laughs> brand. Shall I copy it and paste it into the other thing? <laughs> Yep, our semi-realistic stylized soda can. Let's go. <laughs> so Master. hopefully that answers the question. But yeah, what I am going to do is I'm going to record a little quick thing and throw it on um, socials just awesome. to answer that question as well. Teasing. Yeah. More to come. Let's go. Always more to come. Uh, cool. Right. Back to <laughs> back to the burger. So where are we at? Cool. Yeah. So we're we're ready to kind of start thinking about the rest of the scene and, and the, the composition, because that again is what is going to help sell this a little bit more to be a little bit more potentially uh, realistic. Um, so again, I just wanted to keep things like super simple. That's the whole idea behind um, incorporating all of these elements together is to try and create a nice result, but also by still keeping things like nice and simple and, and quick and easy as well. So the other elements in my scene, let's, is this, there we go, let's make that a bit bigger. So the other elements in my scene, as we can see, we only have four other elements which made up that final shot that we showed at the beginning. And the first two are just two planes. The concrete wall in the background and the wooden floor uh, on the bottom. And that is it. They're literally just two planes and they don't even connect. They don't even connect. Um, because I knew my shot was going to be like a low down one of pretty much just the burger. So I could get away with it just being two, two planes on here. And then just to sort of talk a little bit more about the asset browser, 
we have a whole bunch of really great models that you can use inside of here. So if I search like food, for example, we can come in, we have some relevant for Redshift. So if they have this little uh, Redshift icon here, they are textured and set up for Redshift. But what you can do is you can still recreate the materials for the original models as well. So we can still use those. And I just ended up taking these two, let me, have I hidden it now? There we go. And then this one. There we go. So I just grabbed the, we've got like a ketchup and a mustard bottle. So I just thought I'd grab those and throw them in the background just to add some depth to the scene and add some extra elements to help, to help sell the shot a little bit more. And this is the entire setup of the scene. This, this was, you know, as, as difficult as it got. And then from here, I then looked at starting to incorporate Redshift and starting to look at a composition. And at this point, I would then change my renderer to Redshift. So this is really important. If you are, if you are new to working with Redshift, then if you're working in Cinema 4D, um, build all your elements and build everything you need, like your geometry wise and your animation, do all that in, with the standard renderer active. You don't need to activate Redshift. You only need to activate Redshift when, you're, when you then want to add things like your lights and your materials and then do your final render. And the reason I say that is because when we change our renderer to Redshift, it then automatically assigns a whole lot of the percentage of the GPU to Redshift. So if you're working with simulation or you're working with pyro, Redshift will be taking a lot of your GPU power um, purely by it just sitting here being the renderer chosen. So yeah, do a lot of stuff in standard. And then when you're ready to then start working with Redshift, then change your renderer. That's awesome, because I think you just actually answered this question here, which is, is there any reason to use the RS material versus the RS standard material? So, um, so yeah, so that's that's sort of more on the material side of things. So let me just quickly, let me just set up my output, and then, yeah, I'll talk about that. So I ended up just doing like a 2K, okay. um, something like that. And that's all I'm going to change for now. So, yeah, now, because I've got, Redshift uh, active, when I double click, it's gonna create a Redshift material. And what it's going to create is a standard, the Redshift standard material, which is what was talked about in that, in that question. Whereas previously what we had was something called just the Redshift material. So we had the Redshift standard and the Redshift material. Let's, let me rename this just so we can, there we go. Cool. So the Redshift standard material is a more industry standard and what we'd call energy conserving uh, workflow. Um, we can also create what I would say is like more realistic looking textures and materials. And also the way that we can create them is far simpler than the way it was in the legacy Redshift material. So if I just open, actually, I don't even need to open this up, but let's give us a little bit more room just so we can see our attributes. So if we take a quick look at our base properties in here, you'll see that we have slightly different set of options compared to the, the legacy Redshift material. Um, especially when it comes to creating things like metals or creating subsurface, like subsurface is the real big one. So if we click on subsurface, we have, you know, quite uh, scientific um, settings inside of here. Whereas inside of the newer standard material we have really nice kind of color weight and scale values makes it far easier to work in in there so it is it is up to you how you want to work i would recommend just working with the redshift standard material because it is more industry standard and you will get um I think you'll get faster renders because it's also more energy conserving. Um, however, some people do like this older workflow, uh, legacy workflow, because you have some preset options inside of here, whereas this standard material doesn't have those. Uh, so yeah, it's it's up to you really, but I would personally recommend sticking to the standard material. It's newer and it's better for a reason. So you, cool, so you, so you the, 
So which one would you say is faster? <laughs> the the standard, the Redshift standard material, which is the one when you double click, that's the one that you get. Perfect. I'm making a mental note and answering yes. the question at the same time. <laughs> cool. Yes, I would. I would definitely go with that. Okay, cool. So, so we've changed our render to a Redshift, and now we're now we're good to go to start doing things like creating our lighting and creating our materials. And I'm just going to quickly, I'm going to quickly break these down, and then we're going to look at how to create these substance materials as well. Um, and then I want to hand over to Dustin, who's going to talk about some really cool lighting stuff as well. Cool. So inside of my render set, and so yeah, all we did was we changed our render to redshift and we set up our output to be a 2k and then what I like to do is I like to work in the redshift render view so what this is going to do for people who are new to, to redshift or have never really worked with it before it's going to give me a, a live a progressive update or a preview of how my final render is going to look to a degree it's not going to give me a final polished version but as i start to build my materials and my lighting i will get a much more accurate representation in my render view than i will in my viewport and you'll see as i start to build things how that actually looks um, side by side and the only thing i do actually like to change is for for faster working inside of here and what we'd call time to first pixel which is when you make an update and it refreshes decrease your progressive passes. So progressive passes are set to 1024. And what that means is, as we can see, it's progressively rendering over a period of time. But we don't necessarily need really crazy high detail. I would rather work faster than have a 100% accurate render view. Um, I don't need to do that. So we can see now already that is that's worked. And it's going to just uh, be a little bit faster when it comes to updating. And also, if you have the, the power or the GPU in your machine, you can also increase your bucket size to something like 512. So you'll notice that because I'm on an M1 MacBook Pro, it says your GPU has a lot of VRAM. We recommend increasing the bucket size. Uh, this is what it means. You can increase that. And again, it will be it will not only be faster in the render view here, but you'll also get faster final renders uh, when you come to do that as well. So those are the only things that I change with regards to Redshift when I'm first work in. And now I'm good to start building up my composition. So I'm going to create a camera, I'm going to look through it, and then I'm going to choose my focal length. I ended up going with a focal length of about 100. I believe like 80, I mean, Dustin will be able to give a lot more uh, great advice on this. I believe 80 is sort of like a natural portrait kind of shot, right? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely good for compression. Um... It's, oh man, we, we could get into the rabbit hole, but yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, so I ended up just with a focal length of 100 millimeters just to yeah, really bring everything a little bit closer from the background. Uh, whereas if I had a, a lower or a smaller focal length, it's going to push it further away. Is that is that the right way around? Uh, yeah. So, okay. So generally the higher the focal length, the more compression you have. So that's taking the, the background and foreground and kind of smushing it, uh, visually together. So the, the closer things will look, if you go more of a wide focal length, um, that's going to, it's really good for hero angles. So if you go to like, you know, yeah, it, 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 there you go. So if you, if you go to a lower focal length and you frame, you know, your burger, it's going to be a, a big hero burger. Um, super cool to do. Uh, it just depends on, you know, what your application is. <laughs> but <laughs> going to something like 100 millimeters um, is definitely going to, you know, compress the foreground and background and, and give you uh, good looks. Also really helps with depth of field. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you want to have a nice uh, shallow or like milky depth of field, we might call it, um, that's definitely going to require a higher a higher focal length. Uh, so anything really, you know, like the, I like to use anything from 50 to like 200 millimeters, uh, depending on what, you know, it is and how close I'm getting to the subject. So this is also where scale comes into play. Um, yeah. You know, when, when using focal lengths, uh, you can, you know, uh, I don't know, we'll say 200 millimeter, you know, focal length is going to look a lot different on a fighter jet 
um, <laughs> than it would on a cheeseburger. So <laughs> distances, distances uh, play. I a think lot. that's my favorite phrase of the stream so far. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Talking about fighter jets and cheeseburgers in the yeah, same I, mean, I like it. it. Oh yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, we're getting the danger zone right now. Let's go. No, that's cool though. That's that's great information. Thanks, Dustin. Yeah. And we one other thing, a... I oh yeah. Oh, sorry. We did have a, a no, question. Um, kind of uh, same. Moving on, like could it expand that a little bit? So more VRAM equals smaller bucket size, or no, so if you have um, if you have more bigger. VRAM, so if you have kind of like more GPU power, you want to increase the bucket size, and you will get uh, faster render times. Um, that I, I don't know the kind of like the the technical reason behind it, but basically, so the bucket size is the the little squares. When you do a final render or you do a bucket render, you get the little squares that come across. And and what's happening is is though the size of that bucket is is here. So we've got 512 by 512. So we're going to get larger squares and larger buckets. And what happens is because then it's taking advantage of all the GPU power, it's rendering each of those buckets faster. And so because there are effectively less of them, um it it does actually speed up the render times and i've and i found this myself personally um by increasing it to 512 i do i'm able to knock off like certain percentages of my of my render times um yeah but weird, weirdly, yeah. yeah so like weirdly enough if you use the horizontal uh bucket order um i have no idea why but sometimes that can also like kind of help things run a little bit smoother oh really oh that's idea. cool <laughs> but <laughs> when you play around and start clicking enough buttons <laughs> yeah oh that's cool i'm definitely gonna try that one out but yeah so hopefully that helps answer that that question so if you have a a more vram or powerful machine chances are it will give you that that little kind of message down here which is what I've got. So I know that I can increase, I can increase yeah. that. I have never gotten that message before uh, for the record. So <laughs> I'm kind of jealous. Unless it's honest. a Mac thing, then it may be a Mac thing. I don't know. It's usually like, yes. hey, your, your, your graphics card is, you know, doesn't have enough VRAM. So um, <clears throat> Are you uh, when, okay? <laughs> when in doubt, you'll like this seg segue. When in doubt, Cinebench it. If you're not sure what your system can handle, Jump on Cinebench, give yourself a nice little mm -hmm. speed test, see what's happening with your machine, and then you can always adjust from there. So the more you yeah. know. And when in doubt uh, and, and your render is less than uh, where you want it to be, just call it stylized and you win. Yep, stylized master. <laughs> <laughs> the Max on team said... <laughs> Don't quite ask, please. Um, okay, cool. So really quickly, because we're like drastically running out of time like because we're having too much fun but we're going uh, do, over that's just we're fast. going way over <laughs> disclaimer <laughs> we're going over um i want to talk a little bit about um the the composition options inside the redshift camera if like me composition is not your your strong suit then inside of the redshift camera inside of display we actually have these composition overlays and if i just sort of click them hopefully it can be seen in in the stream but we get given these little like grids or we can have the, the golden spiral. And it'll give you a nice idea of how to then start to position your composition. And again, reference images, or for this particular shot, I actually looked at a bunch of shots on um, like product photography, because I thought, okay, how can I make the product, the cheeseburger in this case, the, the main focal element? Um, and that really helps me to learn how, how things should look. Because sometimes I'll look at things, I think it's not quite right, but I don't necessarily have the experience to, to know why it doesn't necessarily look look right. So these things are a nice little thing. I always use the grid. Like, or you're this, like me and you're like, everybody does the same thing, so I'm going to do something different. Then you post it. And then the next day you're like, why did I do that? It looks dumb. <laughs> so <laughs> this is helpful. The, uh, story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Um, cool. Yeah. So I'm just going to leave this as it is for now. And I just want to really quickly talk about like some lighting and then we're going to build a texture. I'm going to show you the final file, uh, which 
you can all have, by the way. Um, so it's totally fine. I'm going to supply that project file and then I'll hand it over to, to Justin. So the way I like to work is I like to create most of my lighting first. Everyone's different. Some people will create materials first or textures. Some people will create lighting first. I like to get 80% of the way on my lighting and then I like to build my materials and then I'll finish it off um, because they work hand in hand. So like when I when I add lighting, my textures are going to look different. When I add textures, my lighting is going to look different. So just find a way that works that works for you. And the way I set up my lighting for this was super simple. Again, that's that's my that's my theme of the day. I always like to start with a dome light. We're going to create some really nice overall ambient lighting. And you'll see on my render view, it now update and change. And this is where you can see how different the Redshift render view and the viewport really are. My dome light is really great because I can then add a HDR image. Let me just find the one that I use. And when choosing a HDR, or in this case, when I was choosing a, a HDR image, I wanted to create, think of where this could be. So in like a restaurant or a cafe or in a kitchen. And so I wanted to find a HDR that matched not only that type of lighting, but also that kind of aesthetic to help again, sell the story. Like all of these little tricks are what is going to help sell it when it comes to render time. So I just got this little like cafe HDR from uh, Grayscale Gorilla Guys. And it should yeah. update. And there we go. Somewhere. That's 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 the first light. And um, what I would then do is I would then start to look at my intensity, exposure, hue, and saturation. Because sometimes it may not be exactly the aesthetic that you want. You may need to increase the intensity. Um, and so really kind of have a look at some of those settings as well when it comes to lighting, um, especially like a simple lighting setup. We can still get a lot of power and a lot of nice um, information from a simple setup. And then I tend to always couple a dome light with a, what we'd call a bounce card. And effectively, if we just grab something like a plane, scale that down. And if I go to my four views and go in here and just rotate this about 90 degrees, doesn't need to be perfect. And what I'll do is I tend to reposition this the opposite side of where my light is coming in. So as we can see here, the light is coming in from, from this side we've got a nice bright area here and we're getting some some shadows here what you can do is you can throw an area like that side which you will do eventually but a real kind of cheap trick is just throwing in a plane and if we have a i mean no color or texture or a pure white texture what it's going to do it's the light is going to come in and it's going to and it's going to bounce off of that plane or that bounce card that light that light color and it's now lighting the opposite side of this without me having to add another light so it's not having to 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 render another light so if we switch that off switch that on and this is a trick i tell you i do in pretty much every single one of my of my renders it's something i always like to talk about because i think it's just such a nice way of just creating some extra lighting here without having to create an extra light and then the rest is literally just two area lights. So if I come in and I grab an area light, so area lights are gonna help support the, your, your HDR lighting. It's gonna help brighten up certain areas and brighten up those, those, sort of, those darker shadowed areas. But it's also gonna, what it's gonna do is area lights, when it comes to surface detail um, and displacement, area lights bring out more of that detail than the dome light and the HDR will. So it's always nice to maybe incorporate them, them together. And what I like to do in my area lights, I like to hit this little arrow here, tiny little drop down here, and that's gonna add a target tag and a null. So we can see we have a target tag on here, which is now targeting this null, which is this. And what I like to do, I like to put one on the left-hand side and one on the right-hand side for my two area lights. And I do that by using the dynamic place. So I can dynamically place this null. And so you'll see that my light is sort of changing a little bit. It's changing its, um, its angle based on that. And then we can just come in and we can start to tweak this lighting. And so I'm just gonna make these a little bit smaller because again, because we're working with 
the, the it's like a, a real world scale or a smaller scale having a 200 centimeter by 200 centimeter light is just going to create too much of an intense light in my scene so let me just sort of pull these out maybe we can pull that plane back and sort of bring that in here maybe bring it up a little bit so I like to work in my four views when I'm doing things like this because uh, then my render view is still giving me what my camera is seeing, but I'm able to come in and start to play around and adjust like lights and, and um, things like that inside of here quite, quite easily. And then I'm just going to reduce my intensity. I might even sometimes switch off my dome light and start working like this just so I can see exactly what this light is doing. And then I'm going to add my second light and I'm going to do the exact same thing and just put it on the other side. So I'm going to put my target tag there, make this again just a little bit smaller. And then pull this down and then just move this over. Maybe something like that, maybe something like this. Cool, so this is all my two area lights are doing. And then I throw in my dome light. And then this is the kind of light setup that I, I did and do quite a lot, especially for something that is potentially like a daily or just a relatively quick-ish render that I'm doing in the day. Uh, this is the setup that I would have for that. And it was a setup that I used for that final shot. And from here, we can then start to build up those textures. So we can take, remember, however many minutes ago, we created those textures in Substance, we exported those maps. This is how you can then put them together. And the process will be the same um, for pretty much all of your uh, texture maps or your texture sets. So let's double click to create a redshift material. Let me just, just save incremental just in case. And I'm gonna throw this on the, the top one. And I'm gonna double click that and we get our Redshift node editor. And what we need to do, we need to come into that output directory, which is where we saved all of our texture maps. So I've got them here. And I've got the burger bun, bottom bun, base color, height, normal and roughness. So those are the only things that I, I set up on here. And I'm just gonna drag and drop them inside. And again, the process would be the same for the top one as well and the other textures that I um, created. So what do we have here? We have the roughness, we have the height, we have the normal, and we have the base color. Cool, so the way that we put these together, let me just make these a little bit smaller so we can see everything, is first of all, because I'm working in the ACES color space inside of Redshift, which is the default, anything, any texture map that is going to be controlling a color input, for example, this color here. So if we have like a color picker or a color swatch, that is the color input. Its color space needs to be sRGB. Anything that is then controlling uh, numerical data, so in our case, we can see our metaness is a value of zero to one, roughness zero to one, that is, um, numerical data. These all need to be set to raw. I did a quick tip on this. So if you want to know more about that, then let me know and we can drop that in the chat as well. And then we can connect everything together. And the way that this works is inside this node editor, we get a bunch of pre set up inputs for us. And these are the most common parameters, the most common inputs. So if you're brand new to working with Redshift, brand new to work with Blade Materials. This setup is trying to help you as much as it can. It's trying to tell you that this is the base color. And so this here, this texture here that we created was the base color. And so if I plug that inside of here, That you doesn't look... You gotta look... do the sound effects. You gotta go... It also doesn't look right. Hmm. Have I not... Sorry, bear with. Have I not imported the... Yeah. I'm unsure why that's not mapping correctly. We have now entered 
troubleshoot mode. We have. We that is going. I'm going to make a sound bite for my streams where I do that. Boop. We've now entered troubleshoot mode. <laughs> is this why? Because it happens. Oh. Okay. Okay. Who gonna who's going to win? Who? What have I done? What have I done? Okay, uh, I'll give you a little clue. Oh, so this, this is all right, chat. Uh, you put the bottom bun. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> like, just, this this stream is just getting better and better for me. <laughs> all right, I promise I do exited. actually know what I'm doing. I promise. We've now exited troubleshoot mode, and we've okay. It out. So <laughs> let's just. It was at this that. moment. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh dear. See, right. This happens go. all the time, though. This is why naming conventions is super helpful because they'll help you figure yes. it out quickly. Imagine if that was named Polysphere One and Polysphere Two. Just think how long mm. that might have taken you to figure out which I mean, was named which. I'm just saying it very quickly became a stylized burger. <laughs> Am I wrong? <laughs> I just wanted to use it as a, a teaching moment. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure. yeah, yeah. <laughs> All of this stuff I do on purpose, everyone. <laughs> That's perfect. Make sure you grab the right texture. And yes, most important takeaway from today is uh, don't accidentally put the wrong texture maps on the wrong thing. Okay, so let's pretend we can just cut out that old bit. Have I done the same thing again? You did the same thing. <laughs> oh my god! What's... <laughs> so to reiterate, do not grab the wrong texture. Okay, so this is what you don't do. What? Oh god! Oh, I don't know what's wrong with me today. Just gave hot cross buns a new meaning. <laughs> I can't even use the excuse for it's a holiday here because it isn't. <laughs> That's right. It's Monday. Okay. It's Monday. It's, it's, mo it's Monday. Monday. I mean, yeah. Yeah, who <laughs> thought me running a stream on a Monday was a good idea? Max on. Okay, so take three. Third time's a charm. <laughs> if this doesn't work, I might just uh, switch the computer off. <laughs> right, hey, this is what it's supposed to look like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. So to, to recap, don't do any of those things. Put the right texture in the right input. So... Today base color is going to go <laughs> sorry <laughs> this has to be is, I'm is, if you, you want if you want to do a daily it's going to take you it's going to take you five <laughs> hours if your name's ellie wade apparently <laughs> um cool yes so base color connects to the base color input which is given there for us and now we can see that the color is being overtaken by this texture map the correct texture map and then we're going to do the same thing with the roughness and again we have that nice roughness input so we can go into there. And then we have we have our normal map. So our normal map's slightly different. And the way that's going to work is it's going to plug into the bump map input here. Whether you have a bump map or a normal map, they both are controlled by the bump map input. What we need to do is we need to tell Redshift that this texture map here, just this image texture map, needs to be considered as bump or normal information. So we can't just plug it straight in. And we can kind of get an idea because we've got a little yellow icon here and a purple icon here. So it also tries to give you a, a helping hand with, with the colors as well. So what we do need to do is we need to say, okay, cool. We got ourselves a bump map. And we're going to plug that in between. And we're going to now tell this that this is going to be a bump map. And it can now go into here because we've got a little purple icon. So we connect these things together. And the input map type here, if you are working with a bump map, so a grayscale texture bump map, you can leave this to height field. If you're working with a normal map, you can do tangent space normal. And we don't often talk about this. I very, very rarely talk about this object space normal. But in this case, because my texture map has been created exactly for this object and this model, I need object space normal. So the rest aren't going to be uh, accurate. So this is where this input or this uh, map type is really handy. If you've created your textures specifically for um, the objects that they're going to be on, then you need to set it to object space normal. And then we can <laughs> choose our height scale. Knowledge bomb. 
Does that make okay. up for the fact that I did all text maps? <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Uh, yeah, three times re- in a row. You've redeemed yourself. You are good to go. Oh, I just so. know. So if you guys use Substance Painter the way I use Substance Painter, basically ob- uh, the object space, that's the one you're going to use all the time because I use that all the time mm-hmm. because I'm always bringing maps over. So Yeah. So the tangent space normal is like if you download from like Ambient CG, you download like your own texture, which wasn't necessarily created for the object that you're going to put it on, then you can just use tangent space normal. Um, then that'll work. And finally, let's add a little bit of displacement. So this works in the same way. We have to tell Redshift or tell Cinema 4D that this texture map here is going to be considered as displacement. So we can plug that in there. We can go text map, which is short for texture map. And then this one actually gets connected to the output. You'll see we have a displacement in bit here because it is going to be affecting the uh, rendered geometry. So we can plug that into here. And uh, nothing's going to happen straight away because we do also need to do one more quick trick on the object that has displacement in the material. You need to right click, render tags, redshift object tag, and you can override tessellation and displacement. And this is going to then show inside a render. It's going to be a little bit crazy. Hey, here we go. It's exploded in the oven. And we can just reduce that scale down a little bit inside of here. So maybe go 0.1. So see those little seeds on top. Cool. So this is how you would build up those texture maps. An extra little thing, just because we I know we're sort of talking about the substance workflows, is if you are create or have created a metalness map or a metallic map, that will be going inside of here. If you have an opacity map, that will be going inside of here. Another one you may have is emission. So if I just come into this standard material on my base properties, because this is where everything will be plugged into apart from displacement, you can come in and emission, for example, we can command click and add our emission color map or things like subsurface. It will be, chances are, it will be the subsurface color and then we can control the weight on that. That's how you can do that, just in case you you create more texture maps uh, other than these these four here. Cool, so let me go head over to the final project file because I do want to hand, hand over to Dustin. Um, let me open this one here. So this is the final the final project that has the all of the textures on and the rest of the textures for now I actually just created inside of Redshift because it's a software package that I am used to and I'm used to creating materials that way. Eventually I will replace them all but I just wanted to quickly show that you can actually do some other like tips and tricks inside of Redshift materials kind of similar to those that you do in Substance. So thinking about like procedural noises or layering up different colors and um, masks and, and dirt maps and roughness maps to create quite interesting looking textures as well. And that's what I did with these. And I want to show once it's uh, finished processing. I think it's got some heavy depth of field. That's probably why. Yeah. Yep, but yeah, it's a very rinse and repeat process, which is good yeah. to know too. So everything that Ellie just showcased, you're literally going to do that for each and every object that you've done, which is also too why grouping objects together when you're prepping your scene files, you know, like what I could have probably done to make Ellie's life easier was just put the buns together and she could have textured the buns as one object. That way, you know, she wouldn't, if we wouldn't have had map miss up, <laughs> that's my fault. I'm taking blame for you. Uh, but those things like that could have easily. I'm helped. being, I'm being targeted here. <laughs> <laughs> no, nope, you're not targeted. No, but you know what I mean? Like things like that, making your life yeah. a little easier. That's, that's definitely a good approach. So I would say, yeah, it, it, you know, um, when you're starting to do that stuff and hopefully you guys didn't hear those crazy explosions, my kids run through the house. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but basically, yeah, if you're if you're going to go through it, just group those objects together and then make them simple. Um, it'll also make your, your workflow a lot easier. But it's a rinse and repeat process is my point. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the same way that we just created that one material is probably how you'd create most of them. Um, but yeah, so this was the this was like the the, the burger or the or the patty uh, material that I created inside of Redshift. And it's basically just using a bunch of different Maxon noises. 
So inside of here, we can grab max on noise and you have so, so much control to choose how this noise looks. So if I solo it, it will show up in, in here. And all I did was just play around with a few different things, the inputs, the remapping and the outputs. So for example, in here we can do high clip, low clip, brightness and contrast and really dial in these noises, which are all procedural. So you don't really have to worry about UVing in this case. And so I just got four of those, used a ramp, to control the colors. And then I use a color layer, which is a similar, think of this as, as a similar way of just layering things together. Um, we're able to layer color, different colors together. We're able to then use um, different masks or layer masks. And then we can use blending modes, very similar to what we can do inside of substance or, or just like take some of those or some of that same thought process and incorporate inside of, of Redshift. And then, I was a little bit lazy, used the same Maxon noises, ju just m combined them together inside of this color layer and then used that as my displacement and my ramp. That's a little trick I always like to do. Um, cool. Yeah, so this was this was how I created that that texture in there. But again, I'm definitely gonna play around in, um, in substance <clears throat> and recreate all those materials. And yeah. finally, 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 the only thing I did want to mention is also adding a little bit of depth of field is again going to help just add some extra like spice to, to this shot. So we can see we now have that really nice shallow depth of field here, making this the main focus. And then just to remind you of that final shot, that's kind of what it ended up looking like. Um, that's super nice, Ellie. We do have a question real quick before we hand it off to Dustin, and then he's going to work some crazy magic in like 20 minutes or less. Uh, not to put pressure on your <laughs> buddy at all, but the question is, does object space normal take into account world base orientation as world space normal? Oh, I... Oh, hang on. Let me see that again. Oh, you want to see it again? Sorry. Does object space normal take into account world base orientation? Something like world space normal. So basically, if your bun is off on, um, you know, like three inches to the left, does that is that going to affect it? I shouldn't have thought so. I don't I don't um, believe so. I, no, I shouldn't have thought so. I think it's based it's basing it on the objects like the properties. object itself. Yeah. 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 I, I, I was. I was. I was going to lean onto the world of no. It. Sh it shouldn't, whatsoever. Um, yeah. Because again, you've made that that texture. And of course, too. You know, just thinking, just expanding on that idea. Typically, a scene like this. You know, you're not going to be positioning this anywhere else because you're going for a very specific shot. So everything should line up. Uh, should line up relatively in place, even if you scale it up and down. So. You should be you. I'm gonna go on the fence. You're gonna be you're gonna be just fine. But that's that is something too that we can we can get some research on and then give you the answer. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Great question. Great question. Cool. All right. Yes. Yeah, so as, as a quick reminder, yeah, cause we're about to hand over to Dustin, but I will make this whole project file available. Ian was kind enough to say that I was allowed to share it with with the model in. The only thing I wanted to change is the GSG HDRI because I'm not allowed to share that, but I'll find one that makes it look very similar and then yeah you may have it okay thanks casey cool uh, yeah justin okay. show us how it, to make uh, it look amazing we we have to change to my screen yeah just there you go uh, burgers okay so um we're gonna talk a little bit um about some of the lighting and maybe why i do certain things the way that i do them um you know based on a couple of references and what say like a said client might actually want out of this render um so when i'm working whether it's products or food i kind of treat food very similarly to products because at the end of the day like it's usually you know selling something whether it's for a menu or it's a, a billboard it, whatever um it's usually still used in sales so the way that i like to look at this is capturing the most detail from left to right um you know it, because that's generally how 
you know, we're reading um, in, in most parts of the world, we're reading from left to right. And so your brain is kind of trained to read things from left to right. So the first bit of detail that you're going to see is, first of all, what is the most lit, but also you're going to be reading you know, that image, uh, the way that you would read a book. Um, so for instance, uh, with this, this burger here, it's lit really nicely from the left side. Um, you know, shadows kind of falling off to the right with a nice bit of ambient lighting. And then we do have, uh, you know, this kind of fill slash like edge light, um, not super bright in that side, but it's giving a nice glisten on the cheese, um, water droplets on the bun, things like that. And then we get to this image and I'm, I'm super hungry looking at all of these anyways. Like I really don't care what kind of burger lighting it is. <laughs> I'm, just hungry at this point. I'm not looking at the light in. <laughs> to the, to the pub. We need to go um, to the pub. Yeah, right. So like on this image, it's still a really nice image of a burger. But if, you know, if you're looking at this and you start to read this from the left to the right, you're starting to get a lot of, uh, you know, what I would consider almost muddy details that that aren't quite as appealing as they are on the well lit side. And so it, it's kind of the way that I like to think of things. I'd like to light from the left side to the right places more emphasis, you know, on this side here. And then you see that first and your eyes kind of cascade off, like your brain sort of cascades off to the shadows. It doesn't really think so much once you get to that side. Um, and then you can see this kind of variation here where you have more of a side slash backlight um, on the right side and you're relying far more on the ambient lighting to show the details and the juicy nature of this burger. I'm so hungry. Holy cow. All right. <laughs> So with I'm all of that, being, tonight, I've decided yeah, I'm getting some for dinner. Yeah. And so, you know, looking at this, you know, we have the left to right. Um, this is just different, you know, styles and lighting. So the left to right, we have the right to left, and then we have the kind of right to left or sorry, left to right, but a bit more backlit with ambient lighting um, taking over the front details. So in all of these, we still do have, um, you know, a little bit more shadow on the one side. So this one here is quite soft. You get into a little bit harder um, lighting here. And so there's a couple of ways that we can do more, you know, of the hard versus soft lighting. It's really just the lights scale uh, in relation to the object. So if you have a big light and you move that all the way back, kind of like the sun, you move it super far away, increase the intensity, you're going to have super hard lighting uh, with hard shadows. If you were to, you know, say, take a smaller light uh, that's, you know, close to the size of the burger and you move it really close, you can start to get some softer shadows. It's kind of really weird. So uh, inverse square law, uh, we can, I, I believe we've talked about this before uh, quite a few times, but we'll just kind of talk about some of the lighting here and maybe why I do a certain, you know, set of things that I do. So now we have uh, Ellie scene. I've done a little bit of reorganization. Let me just zoom a little bit closer to the burger here. And what I've done, what I like to do is set up my first viewport uh, at the top here is my render camera. So I lock my camera down. Uh, I believe I have it locked, maybe not. We can uh, put a protection tag, put a protection tag on here so that I can't accidentally move that camera. Super important that once you get your camera, lock it in and then work in a different viewport if you're using the render view uh, to view your lighting. So in this case, I just have my other viewport. I believe this is usually the right viewport. I just head from cameras and down to perspective, and then I adjust my shading modes and so on, remove textures, all of that stuff. Don't need anything else slowing down the render view. All right, so from here, we have our dome light. So this is the only light that's in there currently. I turned off uh, the two other lights that LA threw in, and I'm looking now at what the reflections are, are doing um, as well as the ambient lighting and kind of where everything's coming from. So in most of my work, I like to use uh, very overcast or like amb ambiently lit um, HDRIs. So uh, Grayscale Gorilla, it's the Hilton Head rooftop. 
uh, is one of my favorites. And if you're going through uh, something like Polyhaven, it is this guy. So this is the uh, missile launch uh, facility, O3. That's kind of like my two go-to uh, HDRIs that I'm using. I feel like um, you know it's a good HDRI when you know it off by heart, when you know the name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's like yeah. I'm like, a GI Empty Room in the asset browser for a free HDRI was like, I, I used it in so many projects. <laughs> yeah, and so it really just depends on what you're doing. If I'm like, it, for, for metals, uh, you know, I maybe adjust the HDRI and do things a little bit differently, but on most like plastic products, things that don't require like heavy chromey reflections, uh, those are kind of the two that I bounce through. Um, in fact, most often I've been using the missile launch from Polyhaven um, and then a mix of what we have in the asset browser now. So. With all of that being said, um, ambient, li ambient lighting first, I like to see what details are going to be brought out by that light. So when I'm looking at this, obviously burgers, you know, like this whole thing is going to look good in a bit more of a warm light. Um, but there are things that I like to do. Like if we want to counter the warmth of this light, uh, first thing we can do is drop the saturation from 100 to 50. And then we can also adjust the color here. So with the color, uh, I like to usually sit if it's a bit more warm, uh, I'll sit anywhere between 190 and 200 for my hue value. And then I'll just slightly bring up the saturation. And what that's going to do is completely counteract that warmth. Um, so you're adding in more blues to counteract the warm. And that's where I like to sit. So Ooh, I'm trying to make this quick so I don't go until, you know, 2.30 our time, like an extra hour, because I could sit and talk about this stuff forever. <laughs> um, so the next thing that we'll do is turn on one of the area lights here. And this is going to be uh, what will be our key light. So I'll just rename this key and we're going to light this from the right side to the left. And what I'm going to do here is actually force a bit more hard of a shadow. So I can take this light and we can just look at this from the top. Right now, it's a little bit more backlit um, from behind here. And what we're going to do is work with a rule of 45. OK, so if I turn on my camera here and the filter and maybe we'll just go to the top view. There we go. And so we can see where the camera is looking. Uh, one of the things that I like to do for, you know, more dramatic or cinematic lighting is thinking the rules of like a 45. So I'll kind of draw like a line here with my brain <laughs> in the camera placement. And I like to work 45 degrees off of that roughly. And so we can move this light over to the side here, maybe head down into our object and we'll increase our scale. We'll maybe do something like 24 by 24. We'll see that it's going to get a bit brighter. And I can back this away here. There we go. And now we're still going to have quite soft shadows on everything. And so what we can do in this case, if we take a look, we can see exactly how far this light is in relation to the burger. Uh, let's actually move that up. So I like to go 45 degrees off to the side. And then if I'm lighting people, it's usually like 45 degrees from their head. So it's quite a ways up there. Um, now we are going to get some really soft shadows uh, in this case. And so what I'm going to do is take the spread and treat it as if I had a grid um, that's going to force the light direction far more towards the burger here. And so we can do that with the spread. We'll set this to maybe something like 0.25 and get quite a bit more directional lighting. And as we're doing this, the intensity uh, is going to increase. And so this is where we can start to drop it. But we will see that our shadow here is really starting to get more hard. We can drop this even further, maybe like 0.15. There we go. And now from this point, uh, we can start to tone down the intensity. So if we head back up, let me just do maybe something like five and start there. And then we can also 
take our exposure and say something like not equals, but negative 0.5. So we can drop that down just a little bit. And so if we want to see quite a bit more uh, of the details like really taking place, what we can do is just drop the scale of our light. And remember when we're going to do that, that's going to require us to boost up our intensity or take our light and move our light closer to our subject. And so now we should be getting a bit more of those uh, harsh shadows. And we can see that on the floor here. So we can turn on our other light. There we go. And this one is off to the side here a bit. And so what we can do here is just move this in. And what I'm going to do is very similar to what Ellie did. I'm just going to turn off my key light and my dome light here a minute and see exactly how this is lighting. I can just pull this here towards the back and that's going to let some of these reflections start to show a little bit better here on the side. Maybe go a little bit further over so that we can see it on the bun here as well. And then we can start to turn on one by one. So we'll do the key light and that back rim light together. There we go. And so with this key light, we can actually move that down a bit so that we'll start to see some of those reflections here a bit better. What I like too, just gonna point this out on a visual note. What I love about this too, that's why I love about light theory and just what how much lighting can change and, and bring dynamic elements to your scene. If you take a look at the background, Dustin's done a great job of isolating the burger visually. You still see the ketchup and mustard containers, but because of the way light is working, he's getting a darker background naturally, which is now just making that burger pop, but not hiding that background 100%. So it's such a cool little right. two lights and you, I, are, I know. you, you change two it lights. around and incredible. here you are, something completely different. So taking that extra time to just see what the light is doing and how it's affecting your scene just makes it just boom, just chef's yeah. kiss, man. And you just use two lights, that's it. And, and a little HDR, so. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, like as you're, as you're doing this stuff and you're experimenting, like it is important to, it's kind of like flipping your Photoshop canvas. You know, it's like you, you should every now and then like turn lights off because it's very easy to start throwing lights in for, for almost no reason. Um, so like as you're, as I'm doing this, there's a couple things that I'm thinking of. Uh, the first thing is what does the original, like, like, what is this raw render going to look like? Um, and then also like, what can post-production do? Because there are times where I'm lighting this scene and say, especially with client work on personal work, you can take time. You can sit and you can span it out and do certain things, build your own presets and all of that. But sometimes you just have to kick this render out. And what I would think about is like, hey, instead of like going into this, you know, trying to perfect every little piece of reflection, maybe I can do some of that with a specular pass in Photoshop far quicker than it would take me to sit and, and tweak the lighting all day. Um so we don't currently have any passes on. We can turn those on through the AOV manager. Here we go. And we'll look at the specular lighting. We can pull that in. And now we can switch over and give that a moment. And so this is going to give us a really good idea of what our lighting is looking like from a, a reflective level. And so... The reason why this is important is because this is the pass that we would use in post-production to make our reflections um, really pop and stand out. And so reflections are generally going to look really good at, you know, like an incident angle. So being a bit further around a subject so I can take our key light and maybe bring this over to the side and we're going to start seeing some of those adjustments being uh, made to some of the way that the specular lighting is playing here. So we are getting some, uh, let's see if I turn these off. Give that a moment to update. And we have our default. We can turn on just our key light. Let's 
So it does look like we can actually go quite a bit further over. Maybe to something like this. There we go. So what I'm looking at is trying to get some of the cheese uh, highlights here and see if I can play with those a bit further. And then if we bring this higher, it should move a little bit more towards the top. So this piece of cheese, I believe it is, if we go back to our beauty, there we go. We're going to get a really nice um, hit of a specular highlight there. So in this case, we're going to turn on uh, our other light here on the side, and then we can turn on our ambient light, which is going to help us with the background. There we go. So if we don't want to use a backlight um, or a background, sorry, like an ambient light for this, uh, one of the things that I like to do is focus on separation first from the foreground to the background. And then I will place another light just in this background area. So we can grab another redshift area light. Make this quite a bit smaller here. There we go. White background. It looks amazing. And so we make it a bit smaller. Brenda. Yeah, it's a final, final, final. Just ship it. Yeah, ship it. Yeah, I like it. And so we just move this one back here towards the background a bit, and then we can start to tone down our intensity. And now we can start to light the background and the foreground uh, fairly independently while still getting some nice bounce light because she has, you know, a nice ground plane here. And so we're starting to get some nice bounce in this. So we can, at that point, start to mix and match with our dome light and how we're gonna want that to affect everything. So I think if we change the intensity to something like 0.5, allow a little bit more shadow here in the front, uh, we can definitely do that. And then maybe take our light here that's on the side down just a little bit like negative 0.5. There we go. And so, yeah. Very easy way to start adjusting <laughs> your burger lighting. <laughs> no, that oh, was, my I mean, goodness. I was silent because I was like, I'm definitely doing all of these changes. <laughs> no, I'm like, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm way too hungry to like, um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's I, so I, cool I like though, it. like what you can do with like literally a dome light and like what well, at most two or three area lights. Like, it's really yeah. interesting that it, you don't have to kind of go like overkill uh, with like a wild setup as long as you change those right things like even even when you just had like the the side and the key on like it was really dramatic but I was right like, this is just make it look tasty yeah yeah and you can i mean yeah it <laughs> yeah yeah all of that we're all hungry now aren't we so yep. um let's see anything else that we want to talk about maybe we'll talk about the specular lighting for a minute um we can we have we have like 10 more minutes before we do have to jump oh yeah okay so do we have any questions <laughs> no everybody's <laughs> just everybody seems to be enjoying it uh you know everyone's just like mind blown i think yeah, like, <laughs> maybe you have questions. dustin's yeah. the guy like he is the if you have lighting questions he's he's the man yeah, maybe a, a little bit sometimes <laughs> okay i'm so the map. <laughs> you, you know lighting a little bit like i know zbrush a little bit so we're maybe good. yeah just a, just a little bit um I, I've, I've messed around enough uh so taking your spread if we take our spread all the way down um it, it it's going to give us a completely harsh shadow so let's take this um all the way here. And so one thing that I wish that I played around with a bit more, um, even in photography, when I was just beginning or like just getting into understanding lighting is actually mixing a lot more hard light into certain things. Um, it's, it's a good practice to get into. So if you're not very familiar with the way that lighting and photography works, go and research that. Um, 
inverse square law for one, understanding how a light's power is going to fade off as you get further away from your subject um, can be huge, but also playing around with, you know, shaping shadows using different modifiers. So in this case, we're, you know, like essentially using a grid to really focus uh, directional light towards our subject. Um, kind of similar to how you could with uh, something like a spotlight, but with these area lights, we have a bit more control over that. And so what I like to do nowadays is I start with a low spread and then I start to increase that. And I start to take a look at the way that the shadow is starting to sculpt. I, I was about to point at my screen, um, <laughs> you know, for, for instance, right at the top here of the bun, uh, if I drop this all the way down, the spread all the way down, you can see that we have a hard line. And then as we start to increase this, we can really get a nice roll off of light here in the way that that's going to kind of feather down the side of the burger. So this is a really good thing to start playing with. You can get some nice dramatic effects this way. Um, a lot of people, when they start, they go with a spread of one, which also looks beautiful, but you can really direct uh art direct, I should say, the, the way that you want your lighting to look doing this. So play around with it, experiment, and uh, enjoy the process. So happy burgers, everybody. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I did drop a link cool. to um, a more scientific explanation of the inverse square law, but just just yes. like, like what Dustin said, just kind of, you know, explore, but don't be afraid to introduce those harsh shadows. That looks really awesome. I love it. I need to go yeah. eat now because I keep looking at yeah. it's, it's my own burger and I'm now thirsty and hungry. <laughs> so. yeah. Also, thanks. Du like, thanks to both Ian and Dustin, but for Dustin for like jumping in, he like disclaimer for anyone who wants to know, he, he found out about this not, not too many hours ago. And <laughs> of course was like, absolutely. I want to, I want to get involved and, and do this. So like, thank you for, just ignore. always yeah, I, thought it was, I thought it was great i thought it was great yeah such great information i always love learning about lighting um especially with your knowledge and your information that you share yeah yeah it's, it's always fun i enjoy being here with you guys as often as i can yeah we, we love it well so you know we only went a couple minutes over our lot of time <laughs> so so we are going to let you guys go but real quick <laughs> yeah. you know ellie you want to do the magic and the thing you do with the Flashy, go here, do that. Here's a couple codes. Uh, oh, you like that? Well, <laughs> I did the flashy go here at the, the start. <laughs> no, you we can talk, what, talk about as in what, like the events and everything. So yeah, like, exactly. What yeah. Thinking? All right, cool. Just, let me, just a recap. Just a recap. Let me just get that up then. Or we could just say bye. bye and be like, that's it. No. Peace out. <laughs> Peace. <laughs> yeah, we, can, we can do the little, we can do this. There we go. You can still see us as well. So yeah, as a quick as a quick reminder, um, you can see all the events and uh, the live streams. This is also in-person events on the Maxon.net events page. You can see them here. We have a very special Ask the Trainer uh, happening this Thursday and also next Thursday. So if you want to ask us anything, um, then come come hang out. And then next week, uh, we have Mr. Ian Robinson taking taking over week four of this uh do you want to talk about a little bit about what you're going to show or are we going to just no 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 it? yeah it's basically a recap so if you watch one <laughs> week one through two and three it's basically a recap you know um we'll take some more questions but kind of showcasing uh a little bit more zbrush uh, we talked about some zbrush stuff so we'll we'll talk about more a little bit on zbrush and and, and file prepping um, but it's almost it's almost going to be a recap. So I'll have a scene that I'll share that you guys can kind of follow along with. But it's more of it's it's going to be a little bit more of just wrapping up this nice series. So if you have questions, definitely feel free to come in and we'll chat about ZBrush Substance and so forth. We probably won't get into rendering because I don't think I can top that burger. And I'm not even going to try. So... <laughs> I mean, I, I believe I'll be here next week. So if you do have questions about lighting or oh, rendering, cool. okay. I mean, we can hey. probably, we, we can check it out. So nice, leave it nice in the comments, leave the questions. Um, 
yeah that'd be cool yeah it'd be great to have you again as well dustin and also if you do want to catch up on weeks one and two or if you've come in late to this session then they're all on the max on training team youtube channel along with all the other live streams and all the other quick tips and tutorials and sessions that we do as a whole kind of max on collective so if you want to catch up or learn something new definitely check that out and again as a thank you for being part of our lovely community and um letting us overrun for 48 minutes. Um, we like to give away t-shirts. All you have to do is pay for shipping. Um, I think we can drop, oh yeah, you've just dropped the link in again. So cool, yeah, yeah. take that. ZBrush and Substance is that passcode to get in. You can get one shirt. Um, but yeah, you can represent Maxon along with us. So cool. That being said, I guess it's probably about time, maybe, to wrap it up. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah, since you've stayed, since everyone here has stayed with us this long, um, if you go Thank over you. to the uh, ZBrush YouTube, we have a Shane Olson. He's an amazing stylized, legitimate stylized character Thanks. artist. Uh, well, hang you on, might why not something? a legitimate stylized artist? <laughs> <laughs> because he specializes in it. He specializes in it is what I meant to say. So you might know him. If you know, if you have Disney Infinity characters, if you've ever played Disney Infinity, that's some of his work. He's done stuff. So... Uh, stylized, stylized, stylized. Check him out. You guys will love his stuff. He's up next in the next 10 minutes. He's awesome. All right. Yeah. Well, it was good <laughs> hanging out. <laughs> I loved All it. Right. Thanks again, guys. And see you Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone.